courageous defender of the rights and freedoms of his fellow Albertans. A passionate man, standing strong and sacrificing so much for the well-being of his family, friends, neighbours and perfect strangers. Also recently returned from a journey to Ottawa, where he joined the front lines in the Convoy for Freedom to End All Mandates. He advocates for truth and freedom everywhere he goes, and he's not afraid to tell it how it is. And from what I understand, he makes good pancakes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the Whistle Stop Cafe in Mirror, Alberta, Mr. Chris Scott. Well, thank you very much. That was quite the welcome. I take it you all like pancakes a lot. So, I have a bit of an apology. I didn't sleep much last night, so this might not be as entertaining as it usually is. Um, m many of you know that I was in Blackie, Alberta, speaking at an APP event down there. I flew down there because I had to pick my son up yesterday and there was nothing in this world going to stop me from picking up my son and he lives in Falaire. And Falaire is a long way from Blackie. So we flew up to Falaire and then we flew down to Blackie, or pardon me, High River, then had to drive to, to Blackie. Then after the event, we drove to High River, flew back to Cooking Lake and then an hour and a half drive to Mir. So I didn't get home until about three in the morning. And then my daughter decided to maybe not set her alarm clock. So my wake up call was one of my customers saying, hey Chris, is the restaurant open today? The door's locked. <laughs> so out of bed I went in to open up the restaurant, which I don't mind, it comes with the territory. That's what uh, owning a small business means is that you never sleep again and you never make any money, correct? <laughs> so I'm very tired and I apologize for that. I'll try and get some sleep tonight, but it's not gonna happen. My son's home. So, before I begin, um, I want to explain to everyone here and everyone watching how I'm able to do this. A lot of people ask, do you ever sleep? How do you do all these things and go all these places and, and speak at these events? Where do you find the energy? Well, I rely a lot on other people. There's a lot of people standing with me, beside me, who prop me up and help me, especially with scheduling. Lorna. Uh, a couple of them are here today. They're members of the board, uh, the board of directors of WSFullSteamAhead.org. WSFullSteamAhead.org uh, was created by us uh, uh, to advocate for those who have been affected by mandates and to influence policy so that these things never happen to us again. And that fits very, very well with what the APP is doing. They've put forth a platform and uh, policy and, and governance documents that any government could adopt and put us on that path to prosperity and prevent what's happened over the last two years of ever happening again. So that's how that relationship works. With that being said, the way I'm able to afford to do this is because I send my receipts for my travel to full steam ahead and uh, the treasurer goes, oh, Chris, not again. And they pay for my travel. So if you enjoy these messages and you want me to continue doing this, please go to wsfullsteamhead.org, sign up as a member after you've signed up for an APP membership and support us that way. Um, that organization is what allows me to travel across the province and rent airplanes and stuff like that to get to these things. So there's my shameless plug for wsfullsteamhead.org. Now, before I get to the meat and potatoes of the speech that I haven't prepared, I'm going to touch on a couple things that I heard uh, from, from other speakers today. The first one was, somebody asked about our military. What are we going to do for a military in Alberta? Does anybody know how much we spent for the, mili for the Canadian military budget, the Department of National Defense, in 2020? 23 billion. That's not that big of a number. Canada is a very, very big country. It's huge. $23 billion to somewhat secure the Canadian border and our northern border 
which is probably the more, um, more dangerous one at this point, is not a huge sum of money. And for a prosperous and free Alberta, it's a drop in the bucket. Uh, another thing I, I heard was somebody asking about, uh, what was it? Where do we get the gold to back our currency? How many people know how things were paid for, say, a thousand years ago? Gold, silver, precious metals, right? And we eventually formed these governments and these societies that agreed, hey, we're going to use paper instead because that's smart. Let's use something that wears out in a week. So we started using paper. How did those people get that paper? Those notes. They traded in their gold. So personally, if I was faced with a potential crash of the currency that I own and replacing it with something else, I would be considering buying precious metals. Because if you own precious metals, and let's, let's just say, for example, it's a new nation, and they want to have a gold standard currency, where do they get the gold? From us, because we already own it because we've exchanged our notes for the, cur for, for the currency that withstands the test of time, which is precious metals. And now all of a sudden there's a nation that wants to issue notes and have gold standard to back it. It's a pretty easy and, and, uh, and symbiotic relationship there. I think that's the right word, symbiotic. So the reason I brought these up is because a lot of the questions that are being answered at these meetings uh, they're, they're, they're common to the meetings, for start. Uh, they are on the web page. And in the face of the, the biggest question, which is, how do we accomplish this? Those questions all of a sudden become, it's not that they're not important, but they just pale in comparison to the bigger question. How do we do this? And I wondered... Uh, last year, when I first started talking to uh, Bob Leone and Dr. Modri about this, how would we do this? I know now, because I went to Ottawa, and I saw what happens when people are motivated to make change. They make that change. If you bring enough people, you will make the change. You will be the change. Now look around this room. I see some folks in this room with uh, very white hair, and it's occurred to me that statistically, some of the folks in this room won't be around long enough to see the fruits of our labor today. It's a, it's a, a dark statement to make, but it comes with a very, very powerful message. Some of the people that are involved with these organizations and these movements, they might not see the fruits of the labor. They're here for us. They're here for me and my children and my grandchildren and their grandchildren and children as well. There are people in this movement that are doing this strictly out of compassion. It has nothing to do with them. They probably won't be affected. I see some other folks in this room who I know have so much money that it doesn't matter what the government does because they have so much money. And yet they're here for their friends and their neighbors and their children. And that is very, very encouraging. Because the only way something can succeed is if it starts from a place of love and compassion. Things that start from hate and anger, let's take Wexit for example. Wexit was an angry movement. It was a very, very fast growing movement because anger is powerful as well. It went from, I think it was, when I saw it, it was 60,000 people within a couple days or a few days. Facebook page. But that's significant. That's a lot of people. Where is it now? It's gone. Part of the idea lives on in uh, the Wild Rose Independence Party, but Wexit is gone because it didn't start from a place of love and compassion. And that's a question we were asked last night is, we've tried this before. Why is it going to succeed now? And that's the answer. Remember that and hold, hold on to this answer because we're doing this out of compassion for our children, our families, our friends and neighbors, and our fellow Albertans. And in addition, it's a compassionate response for the rest of Canada. Because the rest of Canada is in the same boat as we are. If they don't do something, they will own nothing and be happy. <laughs> Maybe they won't be happy, but they will own nothing. And the rest of Canada, they're searching for answers as well. Believe it or not, there are people that drive to the Whistle Stop Cafe in Mira, Alberta from BC, from Saskatchewan, from Manitoba, and they ask me, 
how do they get the APP in their province? And I'm like, well, it's the Alberta <laughs> Prosperity Project. Um, so you can either move here or you can start your own grassroots movement to do this. However, there is a template now. And as Alberta moves forward to our goal of independence, which we will achieve, by the way, and I'll explain that in a minute. The rest of Canada watches and they wonder and they're hopeful. They want to see us succeed because they want to know that there's a path to prosperity for them too. And if we work hard here and we do this, we accomplish it, when we do, the rest of Canada will be looking at Alberta, number one, to move here because it's going to be the best place to live in the world. And number two, they're going to be looking at it as a template to get out from underneath the thumb of a tyrannical federal government that wants them to own nothing and be happy. So I hope that answers the question about how I could go to Ottawa and see the unity across Canada and then come back to Alberta and want to separate. <laughs> I don't want to separate. That's physically impossible. We actually are right like smack. I thought it was the middle of Canada until I drove across Ontario. I realize now that's not the case. <laughs> but we are in, we are in, the, in the western third of Canada. We're, we're never going to be able to separate. It's physically impossible. Independence, on the other hand, that's a different story. And even as an independent Alberta, what would that mean for the rest of Canada? Do you think they would be encouraged by that? I do. I think they would be encouraged to know that they no longer have to live under that tyrannical rule of a federal government that does not have their best interests at heart. They haven't had our best interests at heart for years. Maybe in the beginning they did. Because, pe well, th they may have. There's good people and there's bad people, right? We have a lot of good people in government. I'll admit that. But it doesn't take very many bad people, very many power-hungry people, to start shifting policy slowly, making little laws, changing things, and putting us on a path to complete servitude to our own servants. Our public servants. It's literally in their name, servant. Who serves who in this relationship? I mean, I've served raw and or breakfast a few times in my restaurant and, and Blaine Calkins, but at the end of the day, I have to go to those two men and beg them to represent me within government. And for the most part, they don't. And I'm sure that's the same for all of your elected representatives or your politicians. I'm sure you've asked them for help. And I'm sure you've heard the same answer. Well, I know you're right. And yeah, we, we, we heard those doctors speak and we know that we're killing people with what we're doing, but I, I can't stand up because then I'll be alone. I had MLAs tell me that. They looked at me, who stood alone last January, not for very long, by the way. I stood alone, stuck my neck out. I totally thought I was going to lose my business for doing what I did, but I did it because it was the right thing. And they said to me, well, I can't do it because I'll be alone. And it was at that moment that I realized there are no politicians coming to save us. Why are you clapping for that? They should come to save us. They're supposed to be our voices. But they're not coming. They were never coming. They did some things that said, that made them look like they were on our side. Like they, they signed a letter and they said, oh, we're going to remove the premier. And then they came out of a room with their tail between their legs because the premier said, well, if you don't vote for me, then I'll, you know, I'm going to take away this for your riding. Or uh, if you vote for me, I'm going to give you this, this, this ministerial position. Or if you don't vote for me, I'm going to tell people this. And they all turned tail and walked out of that room. Politicians aren't coming to save us. But I have some very good news. You and your friends and your family and your neighbors and some people you consider enemies, NDP supporters, are coming to save us. We're here. We're filling rooms all over Alberta. I don't know about uh, what, how the APP booking looks, but our, our inbox at Full Steam Ahead is filling up with request after request for us to come and speak in their town. People are hungry for change. They are hungry. They are hungry for something to give them hope. And we are that hope. We always were. We just didn't know it. 
How many people in, in the beginning of this mess we're in right now felt something in their heart and they knew something was wrong? How, how many of you who knew something was wrong in your heart but probably couldn't articulate it because we'd never been through this before, how many of those people um, thought they were alone in what they felt? Look around the room. Keep your hands up. If you felt alone, look around the room. That's the way we're kept in servitude, by being isolated, by being socially distanced, by being told that we're extremists, and by being made to feel that we are alone in our thoughts of something is wrong with our society, with our province, with our country. We shouldn't live this way. I thought we were free. They make us feel like freaks. The media tells others that we are freaks because we want to be free. But we were never alone. Now, I'm going to reprimand you for a moment. Because all of us who thought we were alone in the beginning, if we had stood up back then, we would have been through this already. So, that's the end of the reprimand. Ouch. So now is the time to start leaning on each other, bringing back the idea of community, which is what we see here, and moving ahead, full steam ahead, to a path to prosperity. And we have the path right here. How many people have taken the time to read through the information on the APP website? Mm, that's not bad. Please do so. Take a few moments out of your day. I know it's going to interrupt your cat videos on Facebook. <laughs> I know it's going to interrupt your, uh, you know, your fail army that you're watching, but take a few minutes out of your day and actually get to know this stuff. The reason we're in this situation right now is because we never got to know this stuff in the first place. I was so happy that the UCP and Jason Kenney were there to save us from Rachel Notley. I was, how many, how many other people were happy? Most of us. It was one of the, the biggest movements that Alberta has ever seen to remove a bowel movement of an NDP government. <laughs> and yet we failed because they told us, we will save you, merge these parties and we'll save you. We'll be a grassroots uh, party. If you don't like what we're doing, you can fire us. We've got this, uh, what was the legislation called? The recall legislation or whatever? you know, or the leadership review, BS. But really what they were saying, and we didn't bother to pay attention and listen, was, sure, we're going to put these provisions in there, but they're going to be our rules. We're going to make the rules because we want to stay in power. So the rules are going to be such that in order to get us out of here, it's going to be damn near impossible. And we've seen it a few times already. Do you remember when all those MLAs stood up and Kenny still remained? Yeah, you remember when they wrote the letter? Nothing changed, did it? Premier Kenny is like, uh, he's a smart man. Because he's been bleeding and swimming in the ocean for over a year, and yet the sharks have not eaten him. He is a very sharp politician. He doesn't lose. And the rules that he created or had a hand in creating through the UCP policy and governance and their bylaws made it so that he could stay. Now, don't be surprised or discouraged if he stays after April 9th. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Jason Kenney is irrelevant. The UCP party is irrelevant. The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters right now are the people in this room and the people in Alberta that are hungry for change. Because I, 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 I wasn't always a cook. I worked in the oil patch. I barbecued at the rig, lots. But I wasn't a cook. I didn't want to cook. I bought the whistle stop for the real estate. I thought it would be a great piece of property to own. And I only started cooking when something affected me. I had two cooks quit. So then I had to cook <laughs> because my business was on the line. And I learned something. I love feeding people. I love making things the right way um, and, and serving people and watching them enjoy what I've created for them and leave my business happy. Not all of them leave happy, most of them do, the, the vast majority. I really enjoy feeding people. And now, hold on a second, I've learned something else. 
as I, as I travel around Alberta, and I try and kind of keep my thumb on the pulse of what's going on, and I try and listen to stories and, 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 uh, and, and reconcile that with what's going on, why is this happening, I realize people are hungry. And I really like feeding people. So that's why I'm doing this. I, I want to make sure that not only I do this because I'm tired and one person can't do it, even 10 people, we need thousands of people. I want to make sure that this hunger that Alberta has right now for change can be fed and we can feed it. Now, I mentioned the UCP, how they're irrelevant. How many people have been to a Take Back Alberta meeting? Okay, so Take Back Alberta um, is, it, it's run by a, a, pol a political operative, I would call him. And at first, I didn't like the guy. He's got a big ego, thinks he's right all the time. Um, but you know what? There's a few things I realize about that fella. I think he may be legitimate in his concern for Alberta. He's a human being. And his ego is a result of years of winning. And what happens when you spend years winning? Your ego builds, right? So I started listening and paying attention. And then I started speaking at the events, not because I believe that that is the path to prosperity for Alberta, but because I was amazed that all these hungry people were actually filling rooms so that they could achieve a common goal, which is get rid of Kenny. But the message at the end of those meetings was always the same. Well, Chris, you know, I, uh, I really like this idea of getting rid of that little weasel. But uh, what next? What do we do next? Come to the next APP meeting, and we will tell you what's next. There's more. <laughs> Put that hook away. <laughs> we have another very interesting opportunity right now. I don't know if anyone in this room is aware, but on St. Patrick's Day, we held a full steam ahead, hosted a conference at the Baymont Inn in Red Deer, and we invited as many people from political parties, from the APP, from TBA, um, uh, people representing industry, we invited them to this conference, and the, and the message was, we do not have time to swing and miss at the next election. We do not have, we don't have time to pretend that we can just build a party and then fail in the next election and win the next one and, and get Alberta on a path to prosperity. That's not going to happen. We have one shot and it's next year. It's 55 weeks away. One shot. So I said to that room, knowing this, and actually I asked them if anyone disagreed, nobody put their hand up. I said, knowing this, what are you people in, you people, in this room going to do to get past these small differences you have and start working together so that in the future we can agree to disagree and have the freedom to do that. And the conversation started and my phone hasn't stopped ringing and, and my texts haven't stopped since then. Something has started. There's an opportunity. There's another one. Do you know how many people have joined the UCP party over the last few months? A lot. And how many of those people do you think did it because they're supportive and like the party? Do you know what happens when you bring a lot of people? You change the world. And in this case, we have so many people that want change that we can actually do things like change a party or dissolve a party. We can do anything we want because we outnumber those who oppose us. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm saying this is the solution and this is the, the, the silver bullets that's going to save us all. What I'm saying is the change is ripe for the picking because of you. But we're not quite there yet. And this is my challenge. Knowing that if you bring enough people, you can change the world. What is your job now? How many people in this room have five friends? Come on! <laughs> we need to start bringing more people. This is incredibly important. I talked to some uh, political backroom workers over the last few days who offered me huge sums of money to campaign as a UCP MLA. That's not a bad thing. But my answer was, 
I will not campaign for any party that doesn't have proper policy and governance and a platform that is going to ensure Alberta's prosperity. So I don't give a crap how much money you have. You change for me, I don't change for you. Are you kicking me off? I'm almost done. The reason I mention that is because even those in politics and in power right now, they feel what's going on. They are trying to capitalize on this idea of a movement rather than a party, which we are the movement. And they're going to try and hijack this. So keep your eye on the ball and tell your friends. Even those political operatives that I knew had no idea what the APP was. So that's your chores. Start being those radios that I talked about. Everywhere you go, meet people where they're at, in the grocery store, in the gas station. Leave rack cards in the gas station. Whatever you have to do. But get this message out and start making these rooms like standing room only. And when we do, we can move a little bit farther ahead. And I'll be talking about what our next step is moving ahead at the next meeting. So if you want to know, I guess you're going to have to come. Thank you.